Today we're going to be looking at Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. And so I'll begin by reading Matthew 16, verse 13. Read to verse 17, and then what I'll do is I'll teach from that portion of Scripture, and then move into verse 18 through 20 and conclude today's, uh, this morning's study. I have to tell you, even as we begin, that... I, I believe that the Lord has placed on my heart uh, the, um, the, the desire, the leading to have an open invitation today to invite people to commit your heart to Jesus Christ. You might want to be preparing your heart because I'm going to ask you at the conclusion of this study to do so. I'm going to ask you to come forward and give your heart to Jesus Christ. So I'm letting you know in advance, and there's a reason for that. I think that we should do that. I think every person ought to com commit their hearts to Christ. This particular portion of Scripture, I think, really gives to us a very distinct reason to do so. You'll see that as we go through this passage. So beginning in Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13, and reading to verse 17. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. When you read your Bible, especially when you read the New Testament, you're going to note something I think very interesting. Jesus in the Gospels basically asks, and it's been enumerated, he basically asks somewhere around 307 questions. A lot of times we speak about when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God a question or I'm going to ask some questions. Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who asks the questions. And when you go through the Gospels, you'll discover that he asks somewhere around 307 questions. Now, 183 of those questions, well, he supplied the answer for that question. But that leaves for us 124 that he expects us to answer. You're going to see that Jesus Christ in his ministry actually began even before we recognize him as after his uh, being baptized and going out proclaiming. You'll see in the life of Jesus all the way back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 verses 46 and 47 how that Jesus was already asking questions because Luke tells us that he was there in the temple he was speaking to the rabbinic leadership, and uh, the Bible tells us that he was answering their questions and asking them questions, so much so that as he was asking and answering, they were amazed at the wisdom of Christ at the age of 12. So Jesus, from the beginning, as we see him recorded in Scripture, asks questions. When we've gone through Matthew up to this point, there are no less than 19 times we see in Scripture, in Matthew alone, up to this chapter, that Jesus asks questions. I'm not going to read all of those questions, but I do have them all down. I'll read a few of them. He asked in Matthew 8, 26, why are you so fearful? He asked in Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, why do you think evil in your heart? In uh, Matthew 9, 28, he said, do you believe I can do this? In uh, Matthew eleven eight, 8, he said, What did you go out to the desert to see? Matthew eleven sixteen, 16, To what shall I compare this generation? Matthew 14, 31, Why did you doubt? Matthew 15, 3, why do, you, why do you transgress the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? And even in chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, he said, Oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand? And so Jesus asked a lot of questions in the New Testament. The question that we have here is of the utmost importance because he's asking the question, Who do men say that I am? And then he asked the second one, But who do you say that I am? 
Those are amazing questions that we're going to be looking at because it's very important for us to see that Jesus asks us questions that he expects us to answer. Now, to give you the context and develop a background and then to move into our study, we know that he's been in a city, and I mentioned to you the city is Bethsaida. And the city of Bethsaida was on the northeast area of the Sea of Galilee. And so what he's doing now is he's moving to the north. He's moving from the Sea of Galilee region, and he's going to the north into an area called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is located about 25 miles to the north of the Sea of Galilee. And he's going to an area there that is uh, actually one of the three sources of the Jordan River. And this source of the Jordan River comes out of a cave. We'll be looking at that in just a moment. But he's bringing them to this area called Caesarea Philippi in order that he might spend some time with them and in order for them to get some rest. It, it may be that he is there for safety because there are opponents of his that are growing stronger in their opposition. So he's in an area that was called Banyas or, or Panias. Um, it, it is an area that the Greeks uh, associated with, with nature worship. This area that is called Banyas uh, was renamed by Herod the great son Philip in order to honor Caesar Tiberius, who was at that time the Caesar, and that's why it's called um, Caesar uh, Philippi. Um, Caesarea Philippi was, was an area that was almost completely pagan. As mentioned, the Greeks thought that Pan, their nature god, sprang into existence there, so it was a site of nature worship. Herod the Great built a temple there to honor Caesar Augustus, so it was a site of Caesar worship. And there were ruins of some 14 temples in that area that had been established to worship the nature god Baal. And so what you have is an area that is saturated with nature and man worship. It's a beautiful area. We've been up there many times. I don't even know how many times we've been to this area. Every time we go to Israel, we will go to Caesarea Philippi. And I have taught this passage in Caesarea Philippi many times. And it's just an amazing location for you to be in, to know that in this general vicinity, wherever it is that, we, that we're at there in Caesarea Philippi, that the Lord Jesus asked this amazing question, this very important question of his disciples. You see, Jesus is busy teaching his disciples and ministering to the people. And, and we're told in, uh, in Mark's gospel that Jesus and his disciples were going from village to village around Caesarea Philippi. And so he is ministering at that time in that general area. And then according to Luke chapter 9, verse 18, Jesus takes some time to pray in, in private. And so as he's been ministering and as he takes a moment to pray, he now comes to his disciples and he's asking them a very, very important question. The question that he's about to ask is the most important question because what he's doing is he's contrasting man's opinion with God's revelation. You might want to remember that as we look at this. He is contrasting man's opinion. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Man's opinion with God's revelation. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what you're seeing in a nutshell, is a contrast. A contrast between what men are saying versus what God is declaring. It doesn't matter what man says, it matters what God declares. And that's what Jesus is going to point out to us in this passage as we go through it this morning. Now, as we look at this, notice in verse 13 how it says, He came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I want you to notice as he begins that he uses the term Son of Man. Now I want to point something out to you. The term Son of Man is what is called a messianic title. Messiah, messianic. It's a messianic title or the title of Messiah. You see Son of Man used in reference to the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christos, you see that in the Old as well as the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13, which is a reference to the Messiah, Daniel wrote, In my vision at night I looked, and there was before me one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And so Son of Man was recognized by rabbis as a title 
for Messiah. So that's important to note because notice with me, Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Now, it's like an open book question. It's like when you went to school and, and the teacher said, we're going to have an open book exam. We're going to give to you the usage of your textbook. And if you want to use your textbook to answer our questions, we used to call them open book exams. Because Jesus supplied that. If you just said, who do men say that I am? That's a different question than who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So he's basically prompting their answer by letting them know that he's Messiah. He's already declaring himself in the question, he's declaring the answer. All they need to do is recognize what he's saying. You see, in the New Testament, as well as the Old, Son of Man is a title of Messiah. You see that in John's Gospel, in chapter 12, verse 34, where the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that Messiah will remain forever, so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? They knew the Son of Man is a title, and yet it was contrasting what Jesus was saying about being lifted up and dying on a cross. It was contrasting with their common understanding of that day of what Messiah was to do. So again, in the question, we have the answer. Jesus' question is really this. What is the popular conception that people have of me? What are the unsaved saying about me? Who do they think that I am? You see, the question actually will expose the unbelief of the people. Their answer reveals that they have heard what men are saying about him. Jesus is asking, what are people saying about me? Because he knows that they have heard what the people are saying. We'll look at that in just a moment. But if you looked at Luke chapter 9, verses 7 and 8, there it says, Herod the Tetrarch, heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. So that was already circulating. Jesus knew that the wave of popular opinion was declaring that he was one of these, and thus he's asking them the question. He's concerned about popular opinion and popular opinion's influence on his men. You see, the influence of popular opinion is to reject Jesus for who he truly is. The influence of popular opinion is always to reduce Jesus Christ from Messiah, always to make him something less than what he actually is. That is the influence of popular opinion and bad teaching. So, today, some people, when they speak about Jesus, will say, Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's the first creation of God. Others will say, oh, yes, I believe in Jesus. He's the spirit brother of Lucifer. Others will say, oh, of course I believe in Jesus. He's an ascended master. Others will say he's a philosopher. He's a teacher. He's a humanitarian. Uh, they will say that, that he is divine, but he, he is not God in the flesh. There are those who will say, well, he's a prophet. He's a wise teacher. But they will specifically say, but he is not the son of God. Now, you see that in Islam from uh, the Quran, Surah 575. The Messiah, son of Maryam, was no more than a messenger. And so you will find that in common speech related to Jesus Christ. You will find that opinion that he was many things, but the most important thing is, who am I? And you'll see that in just a moment. You see, though believers have God's word to them, very often Christians are more open to man's opinion. And part of the reason for this is because public opinion carries an awful lot of weight. People often get caught up in what is called the tide of popular opinion. Now, Jesus is Messiah, the Son of the living God. And that is the central truth concerning Jesus that Satan works tirelessly to contradict. 
Satan will inspire people to say that Jesus is not uniquely the only begotten Son of God, and he inspires people to speak of Jesus in respectful terms, but to refuse to confess him as Messiah. But in the refusal to recognize Christ for who he is, in that refusal, there will always be consequences. And the consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Messiah, the consequence is eternal. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, who is the liar? And then supplies the answer. It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. Satan inspires people to reject that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. If you go to the um, Temple Mount in Israel, and they have there the Dome of the Rock, on the Dome of the Rock is, is a quotation from the Quran that says that God has no son, neither did he beget a son. And so the Muslims will, will uh, insist that Jesus Christ was just a prophet, but not the Son of God. He isn't God in human flesh. But when you look in the scriptures, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. And so when you look in the scriptures, the scripture very specifically says Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He was the one who was begotten of the Father, filled with grace and truth. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, In Christ the fullness of God lives in a human body. In Titus 2, 13, we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this question, who do men say that I am, is spoken because Jesus knows that his men have been influenced by what the world believes. There he is. Caesarea Philippi, beautiful place, a resort area. Around him are the ruins of 14 Syrophoenician temples dedicated to Baal. There's the temple for Caesar. And behind him is a cave that the Greeks believed that Pan, the nature god, sprang into existence from. Right there. We'll look at that in just a moment. And as Jesus is speaking, he's asking this question. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What's the current talk about me? What is being said about me? Guys, you listen to the news. You watch TV. You see movies. You see shows, you know, that, that will present Christ in various lights. You, you see it. You read things. You have friends who have opinions. You hear this all the time. You will have people speak to you and say, well, I believe that Jesus was a good teacher and I believe that he was a good man if he did exist, but I don't believe that, he's, that he actually died and was buried and was resurrected. No, I don't believe that. And you know that and I know that. That's a fact and that's the truth. But you see, when believers are taught through the Bible, what, what believers are being, uh, what's happening for believers is that they're being safeguarded from the uh, deception. They're being safeguarded uh, from the tide of public opinion. And that's why Jesus says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So their answer reveals that they have heard what has been said about him in unbelief. And so notice the response. Verse 14, they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. We've heard it. We've heard these things being said about him. Some say that you're John the Baptist. Why John the Baptist? A couple of reasons. One is Jesus was a cousin to John the Baptist, and there are commentators who say that perhaps Jesus had a physical resemblance to John, and thus there could have been people saying that he is uh, John the Baptist because he looks like John. That's possible, but I, I don't think so. What, I'm, what I lean more towards is the message. When you look in John's message, and you begin in the Gospel of Matthew, and John went out preaching repentance, he even had a baptism of repentance, right? And when you look at the ministry of Christ, the first message that Matthew records is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is the same message that John the Baptist had. 
And so there are those who believe that, that uh, believed at that time that perhaps he's John the Baptist resurrected. But we need to remember what John said concerning himself and Messiah. He said, I didn't come as Messiah. I came preparing the way for Messiah. John himself never recognized himself or declared himself to be Messiah. But people were mistaken because they had forgotten perhaps that which he had said. Then others say, well, Elijah. Now, why would they say Elijah? When you look in 1 Kings, there's a man in the Bible referred to as his name is Elijah. And Elijah is one in the Old Testament who was used by God to perform many miracles. When you read in 1 Kings chapter 17 all the way through 21 and you see some of the things he did, you'll see that Elijah was used by God to cause the rain to cease for three and a half years. Then he caused it to rain again. Elijah called fire down to consume an offering on an altar. He called fire from heaven to consume enemy soldiers. You see things that he did that were miraculous, but two things in particular stand out. One is that he had raised a widow's son from the dead. And then when you look at Jesus in his ministry, Jesus had raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He had raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead. So people are saying, well, those are works that Elijah did, raising from the dead, and perhaps they're saying, he must be Elijah. And then recently, Jesus had performed the miracle of, of feeding the 5,000, then he fed the 4,000. And again, when you look into the life of Elijah, you'll see that he was used by the Lord to multiply a food supply of a widow uh, from uh, up in the area of uh, Sidon. And so he multiplied her, her provisions, and Jesus did the same thing. So there are people at that time saying, you know, even as Elijah uh, raised the dead and supplied food, and Jesus is doing it, perhaps he's Elijah. Some said Jeremiah. Why Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah is known as, in theology, he's referred to as the weeping prophet. When you look at his book, you'll see that he had a great love for the nation of Israel, and he wept over that city in the book of Lamentations. And so Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet with compassion for Israel. Jesus had compassion, right? And so they could say, well, he's Jeremiah. And then there's the fourth category, or one of the prophets. When it says one of the prophets, what is a prophet? Well, we very often think of a prophet in this way. We think of a prophet as somebody who foretells future events. But you need to remember that the prophet also was used by the Lord to declare his mind. So it wasn't just that Jesus Christ was going to be declaring future events, which he does, but he also declared the mind of the Lord. And therefore they're saying, well, either he's John or he's Elijah or he's Jeremiah, but he's at least one of the prophets. Now, the problem with that is that's all true. He's doing those things, but he's greater than all of those people that are being mentioned. They're all great, but they all fall short of who Jesus actually is. And so he asks, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They supply the answer, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Now, he says, verse 15, here's your question. Who do you say that I am? It's not enough that you can repeat what somebody else has said about me. What do you say about me? Salvation is not going to happen for me on a personal level when I can simply repeat what others believe about Jesus. I may be able to repeat things I've been taught in the past, but that doesn't mean that I believe those things for myself. I might have a mom or a dad who is a very faithful believer, but that doesn't automatically make me a son of God because God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. And so I don't enter into heaven based on the faith of somebody else. Like, like John said when he was baptizing, don't think to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Don't be trying to trust in the traditional religious heritage that you have. Just because your mom and dad may be part of the covenant doesn't mean that you are. And so this question is a very personal one. You see, you can answer catechism questions properly, if the question asked, is asked and you can supply the answer, that's fine. But is that something that transformed your life? 
Because true knowledge isn't simply the accumulation of information. True knowledge is the assimilation and transformation that comes through taking in that information. Because we very often think that because we know something that we're educated. That's not the truth at all. I have people in here who've graduated from college who have forgotten almost everything you learned in college. And I'm not saying that to anybody's embarrassment. I went to college for seven years. I've forgotten almost everything. It's just that you study for the class. When you study for the class, you take the exam, you supply the answer, class done, get the grade, move on. That's what happens. But life is different than taking a class. I can sit down and I can write, who is Jesus? He is the Messiah, Son of God. But has that transformed my behavior? Have I become different because of that? There are many people today who can supply the answer who haven't been transformed by the person. And so Jesus is asking that because, one, he knows, of course, that his men are being um, influenced by the opinions of others. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? But then it has to become personal. And this is important for us, for all of us in this room. But who do you say? But who do you say that I am? Because when I stand before the Lord and it's time for him to say welcome or no, I can't say mama knew you, daddy knew you, grandma knew you. No, but who do you say is the real question. And that's why Jesus is asking that question of these people. And so what's the response? You are the Christ, the Mashiach, the son of the living God. You are Messiah. That's who you are. Who do you say that I am? You are Christos. You are the son of the living God. You are Mashiach, the son of the God who is alive. And so when he gives that answer, when Simon gives that answer, Jesus responds, verse 17, and says to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Bar -Jonah, son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Simon, your declaration with certainty is the root of all joy and blessedness that you can have. So blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Your understanding of who I am will result in salvation as well as a life that is blessed by God. Blessed are you. The word blessed there speaks of many things, including the happiness and joy that comes from having a relationship with God. If your professed relationship with God is not producing joy in your life, then it's something to recheck because the fruit of the Spirit contains joy. Joy that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Joy that I'm just passing through. Joy that, that God is on my side no matter what the world says or how the world affects me. Joy that God has forgiven me of my sins. I mean, just a moment ago, you had Fernando up here who was sharing with you how he was addicted and how he was lost and how his marriage was on the rocks. And I am looking at him and I'm thinking, what a great man. He was in the back room, you know, when I came out. He tried to rob me. But anyway, uh, <laughs> God has transformed this man's life. And, and it didn't come through psychology. It didn't come through sociology. It came through Jesus Christ. Jesus forgives sins. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You know, and that's the most important question. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. This didn't come through your study. This didn't come through your attempts. This didn't come through your self-effort. This didn't come through you going through all those classes. This did not come because in my case, this did not come, this understanding did not come because I received water baptism, because I received my first communion, because I received my confirmation. It didn't come through any of that. This came through a revelation of the Spirit of God. God himself spoke to your heart and said, this is true. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and watch me transform your life. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You didn't get this in any natural means. You got this from my Father. In Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. This has not come through natural efforts. This has come through a supernatural revelation. Somebody once said, 
If ever man is to come to a knowledge of God, two veils must be taken away. First, that which hides God's mind. And second, that which clouds our heart. God in his mercy removes both. Thus, our knowledge of God, first to the last, is his gracious gift. You see, the Bible makes it very clear that we do not naturally seek spiritual truth, nor do we have the capacity to grasp spiritual truth. That's because by nature, we not only resist, but we also reject the things of the Spirit of God. That's a fact. Somebody shares with you the gospel of Jesus Christ and the natural response normally is questions and rejection. Questions and rejection. Why should I believe and how do you know? When I was uh, about 18 or 19, I was at a tasty freeze across the street from Sierra High School in Whittier and a guy walks up to me, I was 19, guy walks up to me and says to me something about Jesus and uh, tries to witness to me about Christ. And, and, I, and I was always respectful to people. They were religious people. You should show them respect. So I showed him respect, but I said, let me ask you a question. You say that Jesus is the truth. Yes, he is. You say the Bible is the truth. Yes, it is. I said, how do you know that? He says, what do you mean? He says, I, I by faith trust the Lord that he would tell me the truth. And I said, really? I said, well, let me tell you what I believe. I said, I believe that the Bible was written by 12 men. I didn't know anything about the Bible at that time, really. 12 men who were on acid. I said, some of the stuff that they say, you got to be loaded to believe that. Can you convince me I'm wrong? And I wasn't trying to be an argumentative person. I just wanted to know what he knew because I, would, I was inquisitive, of course, okay. But I rejected. And I rejected because that's what we do. We resist and reject. An interesting little sidelight to that, when I went into the army a year later, I went into... The chaplain, the chaplain was having an evening service when I went into basic training, and the chaplain's assistant, when I walked in there at Fort Ord, when I walked into that, to that chapel, the chaplain's assistant was the guy who had approached me at the Tasty Freeze. Yeah. And I walked up to him, and I said, you may not remember me, but I remember you. You walked up to me at the Tasty Freeze there at, at, across the street from Sierra, and you witnessed Jesus to me. And he looks at me, and I said, I just want you to know I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I've never forgotten that man. They plant seeds. They plant seeds that somebody else may water. God brings the increase. That's how it works, and somebody harvests it. And so, in this case here, Jesus is speaking, and as he's speaking, who do men say that I am? Some say John, Elijah, etc. Who do you say that I am? And that's where it all comes down. And Jesus says, blessed are you, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, because you by nature resist the things of the Spirit. God, through his Holy Spirit, John 16, verse 8, convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's a work of the Spirit who draws you to faith in Jesus Christ. And so as this is taking place, verse 18, and I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. And so after Jesus speaks to him and actually pronounces this blessing on him, blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, he goes on in verse 18 to speak to him in this way by saying, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So obviously the question is, is he saying that the church is built on the apostle Peter? Now I want you to notice Jesus reveals that he is building what for the first time is referred to as his church. But he's revealing to us the foundation of the church. He says to Simon, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Again, is Jesus saying that the church is built on the apostle Peter? And the answer, quite obviously, is 
No, he is not. You see, Jesus is the rock that the church is built on, and Peter made that clear in his own writings. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, the apostle Peter said this, In Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. The Apostle Peter did not claim to be the rock. He said Jesus is that rock. He is that stone of stumbling, that rock of offense. Now, later on, the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 2, 20 and 21 said that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So the church is not built on the apostle Peter. The church is built on Jesus Christ. When he says, and I want you to see this in verse 18, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. The word Peter there in the original language in Greek, Koine Greek is Petros. The word Petros is a small stone. It's like a pebble. You are a small stone. You are like a pebble. You are Petros, but upon this rock, the word rock is Petra. It speaks of a mountain peak. You are a small stone, and upon this rock, this mountain peak, this great rock, I will build my church. So is he saying, you are what I'm building my church on? No. He's saying, your confession of faith in me is what the church is built on. How do we know that? Because in verse 16, when he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, that is what our life and our faith is built on, Jesus Christ. And you are giving the confession that is necessary for someone to be saved. You see, in order for someone to be saved, you recognize through God's revelation who Jesus Christ is. And in 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And notice with me a second thing, he said, I will build my church. So in this, we see that Jesus does the building, and that the church belongs to him. So we don't build the church regardless of our plans and regardless of our programs because Psalm 127 1 says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7, Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase so that neither is he who plants anything, neither he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So growing churches is God's business, not man's efforts. What we do is we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. He draws all men into himself. Now again, he said, the church belongs to him. He said, I will build my church. How is it your church? It is my church, Jesus could say, because I paid for it. I bought it. How do we know that? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Why does the church belong to Jesus? He builds his church because he bought it and he paid for it with his blood. And so he said, I will build my church. Again, the church there in the Greek language is ecclesia. The word ecclesia speaks literally of the called out ones. I will build my church my uh, community of called out ones. What are we called out of? Sin and darkness. We're called out of the world system. And we've come to Jesus Christ. Again, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We were walking in darkness. We were stumbling, meandering, didn't know where we were going, stumbling at everything and stumbling at every sin. We were just meandering, aimless, with no purpose in life. 
But God called us out of the darkness. He opened our eyes to see the light of Christ. And we who at one time had been in darkness now walk in the light of Jesus Christ. And we are part of what is called a new community. See, the ecclesia is a new community. It's not simply speaking of a person's personal relationship with God, but it speaks of a community relationship with God. It's the church. Somebody said the church is not a building where people come together for a religious service. It is a gathering of people who come together in order to worship God and to build each other up by mutual faith and strength. He says, I will build my church. I will call you out of darkness. And I am the one who does it. And notice what else he says in verse 18. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. First, Jesus is prophesying his victory over death. Remember with me, he's in Caesarea Philippi, and right behind him is a cave. As I mentioned, the Greeks believed that the nature god Pan sprang into existence from that cave. That cave behind Jesus, where they were looking, is called the gates of hell. The gates of hell will not prevail. Man's worship, man's philosophy, man's idea of who God is, man's rejection of who God is, man's systems that reject Jesus Christ will not prevail. There is a bill that's before the assembly here in California right now that is attempting to curtail the right of Christian colleges to determine what their philosophy of school is and how they run their schools. A bill has been proposed by um, a homosexual legislator that is an attempt to undermine the authentic communication of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going on right now. It's going on right now. An argument trying to strip colleges like Biola and uh, Cal Baptist and Azusa Pacific and Westmont and all these colleges who have uh, biblical uh, guidelines for acceptance of students and things of that nature, and trying to strip them of the right to live their faith out in the world that we live in right now. This happens all the time. It's happening right now. You watch things in the news and you see some of these horrific things that are taking place, these assassinations, these killings, these shootings, this anger. And, and you can get this idea that, that, that there's no hope. But Jesus would, and this is how I live, by the way. Let me share this with you because it's a biblical way to live, I should say. It's not my opinion. It's how God has taught us to live through Scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. The gates of hell shall not prevail against Jesus Christ. We stand in victory. I read the last chapter of the Bible. We win in Jesus Christ. So I'm not concerned about that. That doesn't mean that, 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 doesn't mean that we're not in a battle. We are in a battle for men's souls. And that's why the church is supposed to awake out of slumber so that God can shine upon them. Because what's happening right now is the church is going to sleep and we're allowing the enemy to creep in because we're not speaking the truth. We need to live and speak the truth. That's a fact. And as long as we just, oh, I don't want to cause people to be upset with me. I want people to flow into my church and give money so I can build buildings. Well, the problem with that is, is we're not teaching the truth. The truth is the enemy is after us, but the truth also is that we in Christ are victorious. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. And Jesus made that very clear. And so we hold fast to that. That's a fact. And that's what Jesus is teaching. Not only that, he's saying when you think about the gates of hell, what was hell? Well, hell is translated actually hell from the Greek word Hades. And the word Hades spoke of, uh, of the place of, of uh, the departed souls and all. And it's in reference to the dead. And so the point that Jesus is making is death has no power over the people of God because in Christ we are victorious. Hades gates cannot prevail because the church is victorious because we're alive in Christ. Jesus is reminding us that though he will die, yet he will be resurrected and live. In John 14, 19, he said it like this. He said, yet a little while the world sees me no more, but you see me because I live. 
you shall live also. So death does not have final victory over us either because in Jesus Christ we are alive. In Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were, in, were held in slavery by their fear of death. You are alive. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. And, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What is he saying here? You will have authority to speak on my behalf on what is allowed or what is forbidden. You will have the responsibility of declaring the gospel and all that pertains to it. We need to remember that keys are used both to open as well as to lock. So the gospel opens people to enter the kingdom, and rejection closes the door of heaven to them. Now, this commission was not to the apostle Peter alone, but was also given to the rest of the apostles. You see that in Matthew 18, verse 18, where he says, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He was speaking to all of the men there. It's a commission that the church has. It wasn't just entrusted to the apostle Peter, but to the church itself. And it started with the apostles that Jesus commissioned to preach the gospel. Now, what are you speaking about when you say, whatever you, you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What are you speaking about? So, you're talking to a friend about Jesus. And as you're speaking to your friend, you start speaking to them and you start telling them what Jesus Christ can do. And as you share with them, they may be open or may be closed to the gospel. Now we remember that it's the gospel that opens the doors of heaven. So you share. And one of the things, let me encourage you in this, this is important for me to remember to share. Please don't assume that just because somebody comes to church or even this church, that that automatically means they're saved, because that's not true. I was uh, about 23 years old or so. I, was, I had gotten out of the military. I was going to a church in the local area. It wasn't a Calvary Chapel church. It was another church. And I was going there for their um, youth group because at that time I was college and career age, and so... I started going to this youth group. They used to have meetings where somebody would host it and it would be time for, a, for it was called fun, food, and fellowship. So they would gather and there'd be a devotion and we'd have, a, you know, so we'd just enjoy the fellowship and spend time with each other. And I loved these people and I enjoyed being with them. And I'd been in the church at this time for probably a few weeks, I'm sorry, a few months few months, and, and I now I'm hosting this thing at my parents' house. My parents gave me permission to have this, uh, this meeting at the house. And so, the kids were in the den, and I was in the front room, and I was seated next to a young girl named Gail. Gail was 19 at the time. And I had met her at this church. So we're just seated there, talking, just visiting. It was fun food and fellowship and all, and so I was just visiting with her, and so I asked her a question. I said, Gail, when did you give your heart to Christ? When were you born again? You see, Gail was part of the youth group. She had been part of the junior high, into the high school. Now she's into college and career. She's been there six years. Six years. So I say to her, when did you get saved? Because that was one of the common icebreaker questions that we had at that time. When did you get saved? When did you give your heart to the Lord? That was one of the first questions I ever asked Marie, who became my wife, after a Bible study. First, one of the first questions I asked Marie was, when did you get saved? That's the question we would ask. So I asked Gail, when were you saved? Now again, she grew up from her you know, junior high to college. She's in the choir. She's gone on youth retreats for years. And she looks at me and she says, I'm not. And I said, you're not. You're not saved? She goes, I'm not born again. I said, 
And I have to be honest with you, I shook my head. How could, how could you be in church for six years? I asked her, how, how could you be in church for all these years? And you've never given your heart to Christ? Have your friends not shared with you about Jesus? She's not, not one of them. None of your friends have, I, I have to be honest with you, man, I came out of the Jesus movement. That was one of the first questions you asked. It was a revival. Everybody needs to get saved. So I said, nobody's ever asked you if you're saved? No. I said, but you're in the choir. Yeah, they let me in. <laughs> wow. I shared the gospel with her. I shared the gospel. Do you know what Jesus said? And I shared the gospel. And she listened. And I said, Gail, would you like to give your heart to Christ to be born again? She said, yes. Don't, and I prayed with her, she gave her heart to Christ. Don't, don't think that just because somebody came to church that they're saved, that they were raised in church, they must be saved. Again, God doesn't have any grandchildren, only sons and daughters. And the bottom line is, when you're sharing, like with Gail, I was able to say to her, and notice in, again in verse 19, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I was able to say to her, because you've committed your heart to Christ, Gail, you're forgiven of your sins. Now, I wasn't a person forgiving her sins. Jesus forgives sins. I was simply declaring what is already done. Jesus forgave you your sins. But if she had said, I don't need Jesus, I just want to sing in the choir, she would have remained bound in her sins. You see, the gospel sets the captive free. That's what the gospel does. So when you pray for someone to receive Christ, you're simply declaring what God has said. You are forgiven. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised them from the dead, you shall be saved. That is not man, that is God's word. And so what we do is we say, welcome to the family of God. It's God who by his spirit drew you. We simply were used as a messenger to communicate his message. And Jesus is saying, you are Peter upon this rock, your confession of faith and who I am, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And you have the keys to the kingdom, the gospel. Go and proclaim it and watch what God will do. And in the book of Acts, that's exactly what the apostle Peter did when the day of Pentecost had fully arrived and they had been baptized in the spirit. And all of these people are, are outside there for the Passover celebration walking. And here he comes from that upper room and they start looking at these people who are speaking in tongues and they say they're filled with new wine. And the apostle Peter says, oh, men of Israel, no, this isn't what you think. No, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, who said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And he begins to share out of the book of Joel. He says, this is a fulfillment of God's promise. God has poured his Holy Spirit upon us. And I can declare to you that you can have a right relationship with God to come into faith in him. And many committed their hearts to Christ that day. And the church began to explode because that's what Jesus intends to do. Now he tells them in closing, he says, don't tell anybody right now, but that doesn't mean that they forever are not to say anything. The world wasn't ready to hear this message, but after his resurrection, he said, I'm going to empower you, basically. You will prevail. And he said, I will build my church. The way that we enter into the church is not by walking into the doors of a building. It's by stepping in faith into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and being born again. And he is the one who builds his church.